there are statistics that say that most generational wealth is dissipated within two to three generations. Um, the difference is that most families, most companies, because actually there's a culture that exists in a company just as there's a culture that exists in your family. And most families pass money and not belief systems. I think what for me is so exciting, and as my partner and I travel, we ask, is there a tie chapter here? I'll challenge you today to look for those belief systems that were just shared, those things that you can take into your life, into your organization, and your community, which will mean that we won't just pass money from one company to the next, but we'll create a legacy yep. that will continue to create wealth for generations to come. And that is the type of thing that makes a country, a region, and an economic system great. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. I would like to... Uh, introduce our next panel okay our panel is managing portion control as software eats healthcare we have some phenomenally talented and uh, folks coming to the table with some expertise that I think that you're going to appreciate so our panelists are Sheelan Patel chief executive officer and founder of health access group Rajan Mahajan president Mahajan Medical Center Anthony Diaz, founder and CEO of Health Hero, and our moderator, Sunel Panchal, president and CEO of the National Institute of Pain. If we could have everybody come to the stage, please. All right, morning, everyone. We're gonna go through a few different uh, concepts for uh, in terms of software applications, I think the main areas we'd want to cover is going to be software in terms of physicians as clients, uh, interaction with patients, uh, interaction with hospital systems and insurance companies. So, so and we'll also have questions from the audience. We're going to ask you to put your questions down on the cards that are at each table. Uh, just raise your hand up and one of the staffers will go ahead and grab it from you and then we'll sort through them and then ask the panel the questions. One of the things I would like to start on one of the topics is one of the systems that have been available for a long time is the evolution of uh, electronic medical records. Uh, Dr. Mahajan has had some experience over the course of his career using several systems. I'd like him to go ahead and talk about some of that experience. Good morning, everyone. Oh. So, um, I was the first solo practitioner on the Pinellas County on the other side to go electronic in 2002. And at that time, you know, people were saying, are you sure, you know, is that technology gonna last? But sometimes you just take a leap of faith and you say, yeah, I think, you know, I don't want, my practice was growing at the time, I don't want a, you know, big room to store charts. So I wanted to, you know, just pay less rent, I'm frugal. So that was my thinking at that time to go into Do you want me to hold it? Yeah, I, I Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. So my em emphasis at that time was to just not have more rent to pay for storage of charts. I was not visionary or anything, I was frugal. But I, as I got into more doing EMR, um, you know, so coming back to what Sunil was saying, evolution of EMR. So the EMR was not EMR uh, in 1990, it was called CPR, or computerized um, records. And it grew primarily because of large institutions, uh, hospitals and VA, you know, have in-house setups at that time for doing uh, some form of electronic repository. So come HIPAA, or the regulation for privacy, in late uh, 1990, and that added some more uh, safeguards for privacy to the EMR. So that was the f uh, second major step after institutions took lead initially on the CPR front. And then the next major milestone happened with the high tech act, uh, the meaningful use piece. So what that did was it put money 
you know, uh, for the physicians and the institutions to do adaptation of the EMR or EHR, which is interchangeably used. Um, and it has, uh, in my experience, pushed the adapters which were reluctant or sitting on the fringe to go and get that fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000. I was talking to Shalane the other day on conference call and he was talking about who should pay for all this technology. It is nice and fancy out there. Someone got to pay. With the High Tech Act, you know, uh, the government, in fact, provided that funding and it facilitated the, the speeding up of adaptation. So what has changed, what I've seen change over the years for good or bad? First off, no studies have shown that electronic medical records save money. But on the same side, analog records also don't save money. So let's, let's just get this out of our head that the EMRs are fantastic, they solve all the world's healthcare problem, but that's not true. But yeah, it solved the rental problem. If you're in San Francisco, you know, we can't afford a small office. Forget about having a huge warehouse to store your paper charge. So yeah, there is an advantage to that. And, and, the, and there are a lot of advantages to, for patient care perspective. So let me talk about a few of the things I've seen over the years, which has, in my opinion, improve patient care and also from a, a clinician or small business owner's perspective, help the bottom line. Though it has not saved money uh, for our healthcare system, the, you know, as you know, we spend 19% of our GDP on healthcare dollars. So that has not gone down, that's going up. <laughs> so, so, so besides that, we need to look at other benefits. Financial, I think, is not the best benefit. So from a uh, business owner's perspective, I remember first time I started out with EMR, we had a system out of Seattle called Practice Partner. And you know, you guys are techie here, that was a non-relational database. And think of it, you know, how bad we are talking here that we have thousands and thousands of records and it's a non-relational database. And that's a big company. And that was a pioneer company we're talking at that time in you know, 2000. And that's just 16 years back if you think in perspective. So with that iteration, though the records were good, you know, they, they were set up nicely but not very sophisticated. 10 years later, um, with the High Tech Act and the government got into the act, okay, you want the money, now you need to meet the, for the vendors, the software vendors, you need to meet these 10, 15 criteria, and that, in my opinion, really helped to push the industry forward more towards uh, patient care and clinician, uh, you know, taking care of them instead of just thinking about their bottom line and not helping the workflow. So, so the workflow became the key. And what I realized when I moved to the next iteration of the EMR, but 10 years, maybe seven years back, the next iteration was fantastic. So before that, we have to toggle between the, just the clinical part of the record. So you know, if you come to see me, I have one part where I say, okay, Mr. Smith is here, and this is his chart showing you know, his complaints. But Mr. Smith, financial history, now is sitting in another EMR, uh, or not EMR, just the practice management system. And the poor girls in the, in the back office, in the front office, they were not even talking to each other. And you, you know, that was a very inefficient way of practicing medicine uh, at that time. And not only that, it hurt the bottom line for small business owner or clinician like me, because think about it, if a uh, insurance company wants a access to medical record, now it will request through the practice management software now that's not talking to the EMR, so-called EMR software, which has the clinical records. So you think the girls will take the effort to pull it up and fax it to them? You know, they're busy, they're getting 20 phone calls in a primary care practice every second. So forget about it. 
So the, all those denials sit in a bucket there, requesting records, and they expire. So what I notice with the integration of the practice management software and the, the clinical record uh, piece, once they got integrated, as a small business owner, I think my bottom line went up by 10, 15%, just by efficiency of those two systems talking. Um, and then comes the newer iteration now within the last three, four years of um, newer meaningful use being pushed and uh, you know, population health coming into play, uh, be becoming part of ACOs or uh, accountable care organization. So the data mining and talking to other uh, systems becomes a big player here. And Shalane is the expert in that. He'll allude more to that. I'll leave it to him to uh, address that piece. So now the app space, and Anthony will talk about that, technology has got into the EMR, and I think that's a huge piece, what I see in our practice. So just to give you an example, uh, I, I practice in Pinellas County. As you all know, the St. Petersburg, Clearwater area, though it's changed, but it's still waiting room to heaven. So in other words, a lot of seniors. Um, so, you know, the seniors, you think, oh, gee, you know, they're not going to use the EMR, they're not going to use the apps. Absolutely wrong. Absolutely wrong. I was surprised that I started pushing the, you know, the patient portal where you can access your, uh, your patient records and your medications. And there was, it was just a learning curve for our practice to teach patients, and that was pain because, you know, you're doing all the flu shots and whatever, seeing patients, and the nurses have to also train the patients in patient portal. But once we done that, once we did the heavy lifting, currently we have about 75 to 80 percent of our patients, and mind it, it's a geriatric population, looking at their charts, sharing it with their uh, daughter in Chicago, sharing with their son, uh, you know, in Illinois. So it's amazing. Uh, and then the, the, they send requests, so the apps came into play, and they send us requests for uh, medication refills to the apps. I was like amazed that how our phone systems was not overwhelmed by now the medications refills because they can request their uh, medications through the apps we give it to them. And, uh, you know, it's a mind-blowing, if you think about it, where we were when I started out in 2000 versus 2016, just a matter of 16 years, um, patients are, and senior patients, you know, the, the younger patients like you in the room, you know, they, they have a different mindset, and for them it's no big deal. But for senior patients to adapt so quickly, to me that's uh, amazing once they see the value to them that, you know, if they, if they don't like me, I talk too much, they go to next door, Dr. Smith, um, and they can still take their records there without even requesting me. But that's huge. That's huge in, in my opinion as a portability aspect as far as transparency of care, and that puts me thinking about it. Okay, you know, they're seeing the record. I better look good there. You know, it's not that I'm saying cook the record, but at least when you have the encounter, you take care of the patient, a little bit better, you know, just so that what you're putting out there, when they take it to the physician next door or they show it to a daughter or son, uh, you know, outside, they don't come back and say, hey, mom, your doc is a, you know, you know Dr. Quack in Florida. So, so I think that has improved the quality of care from patient perspective. Thank you so much. Sure. So what, what are the things that the last speaker talked about was fitting a product in the market. And that's where when you start looking at EHR systems, when you look at surveys, even recent surveys of physicians, about 80% of physicians are dissatisfied with these products. And a lot of it looks like the design of the product doesn't really fit our workflow. So you add five, 10 minutes per encounter to now the physician has to do a lot of data entry. So it really slows you down. So now you have physicians are now hiring scribes. So you now have this whole new category of, of or workforce that's been created to have someone actually sit in the room with you while with the patient actually inputting the data. So now you've increased the overhead to the clinicians as well. So there's a lot of downsides with these systems and that's where there's a lot of room for improvement. 
from a time management standpoint, I want to go ahead and touch a little bit more onto some of the uh, data management uh, looking from a healthcare institution, either hospital systems or from insurance company standpoint. So I'd like Shalane to talk a little bit about that. Uh, everybody hear me okay? That sounds like it. So uh, I think that you made a lot of great points, Dr. Mahajan, and uh, my career professionally, so well, I'll, I'll go back a little bit further if that's all right. Now, sure. I, I grew up in a medical household. I'm the only person with an, who doesn't have an MD after their name growing up, so, uh, I, but I consider myself to be the wise one because of that. But, um, you know, from going around my parents' doctor's offices from, you know, the mid-1980s and all the way up into the early 2000s, very little changed. And in 2001, uh, I started, or I, I um, you know, took over a company called Visionary Medical Systems, which did practice management software, electronic medical records, got to see a lot more medical practices. And even then, 2002, 3, 4, you're seeing, uh, you know, medical offices with dot matrix printers with, with you know, no sort of, uh, you know, wired, you know, almost minimal wired connectivity, you know, fax and, and modem being sort of the peak of what they're doing. And uh, it's because there was really not a tremendous impetus to change from, you know, from the time that my parents moved here in 82 until the mid 2000s, uh, you know, everything kind of, the whole model always worked the same and everybody was set up to establish that. And if there were pain points, people had become sort of numb to them over time. And so you would go in and you would talk to people about this potentially transformative technology and there would generally be apathy, um, you know, a little bit of derision, why am I going to spend this money? So you're telling me about how my patient's life might be easier, how my insurance company's life might be easier, but why am I the one making the investment and changing everything that I have to do when I see a patient? And uh, the shift really started to happen, as you mentioned, with the high-tech incentives. All of a sudden, people said, oh, so I hear somebody's going to pay me money to go in this direction. Tell me more. And so uh, you know, I think external factors started to change in the environment. And healthcare reform is a very expansive thing and a very controversial thing. But one of the things that it absolutely did is it forced the conversation on technology and a technological ecosystem around how healthcare is handled and managed. The high-tech incentive was part of that. And then also the introduction of new models. So rather than sort of the fee-for-service model, which would be similar, you know, you have a problem with your car, or you think you have a problem with your car, you take it to a mechanic. The way that that mechanic makes the most money is by identifying the most problems, identifying the most potential problems, whether they're meaningful or not, and convincing you that you, you know, that, that, that all of that is necessary. So volume-based, uh, not necessarily what that, what that car needs right at that exact time. So now from in, in the healthcare world, there's been a shift from volume to value. So there are models out there that say you will be rewarded based on how healthy the population that you manage is over the long term. So now all of a sudden things like uh, coordination of care, best practices, if you know somebody has a, you know, moderate diabetes, but you know that if they, you know, if they cross the line over into severe diabetes, hospitalizations, surgeries, more expensive medications and treatments, more medical visits. So there's true economic value in making sure that that moderate diabetic stays at that level, improves ideally, but certainly doesn't get any worse. And so these are the emerging models that now, um, so at the, at the unit level, at the medical office, um, as was talked about, there doesn't always seem to be a tr you know, tremendous gain in the transaction of seeing a patient and doing all of those other things. But the importance of electronic medical records was that it was the keystone, it was the foundation of an ecosystem because all of these ideas are driven by the idea, the, the concept that information is readily available, um, somewhat you know, organized and, and, and able to be passed on from one person to the next as things, you know, as, as the situation demands. And that was really impossible when the, the, the foundational stuff, the medical charts, were, you know, were, were printouts, handwritten documents, things like that, sitting in file folders and sort of stuck and frozen at the medical office level. That's a lot of information that can't be easily passed over to the next doctor or to, uh, you know, the, the children of an elderly person or what have you. So, the EHR was really critical and forcing adoption of the EHR was really critical because it allowed the rest of this ecosystem to sort of come together. And so now that you can know when, when, you know, when a medical encounter happened, what happened during that medical encounter, 
now all of a sudden this whole idea of value-based care and uh, that I can tell you know the other the next specialist that this has been done or we can remind the doctor that it's time to do this type of you know treatment or this type type of checkup because it's been five months since the person last saw you all of those things are now possible because we've moved things from paper into some sort of data element and that's allowed the movement and that's allowed the building in of a lot of additional layers of value it's opened the door for technology to play a more meaningful role in healthcare because technology always had only a very siloed benefit because there was no way for the technology that the hospital used to somehow complement the hospital or the technology that the diagnostic center was using and that the medical office the medical office was using so uh, it's been really important from the network level to get all of these sort of you know point of care information into a, an electronic system um, <clears throat> we've the business that I have health access group is partly so you know the the, the, the hook for us is um, insurance companies because they stand to get the most absolute benefit from bringing the cost of care down. So they're the people who are willing to invest in a lot of the infrastructure elements. So we have software systems for insurance companies um, be, and, and the thought process there was as a patient, anybody who takes care of you and wants to get paid for it has to report it to the insurance company in the form of a claim. So that's sort of that universal event that happens, and you know based on that claim that, okay, well, maybe there was a medication prescribed, there was a laboratory test, this condition was identified. And so you can use that, you can use that now to maybe build out and start to you know, identify other events, get more people hooked into this stream of information. Um, and that's where a lot of the potential for value add, because if somebody came into a medical office uh, or even a hospital, you know, 10 years ago and said, hey, you know, I have this really cool idea where, you know, people can go and check all the information. It's like, okay, well, that's great when they, you know, when they come here and when they do a very specific thing, but when they go, uh, you know, when they're out of market or when they're over there or when they go to this doctor who has zero technology at their office, I miss all of that. So this is, and, and sometimes partial information can be more dangerous than, than, than no information at all because you can assume that it's complete. So the, the way that the, the, the wired world of healthcare has come together since the advent of healthcare reform is, is really tremendous. And uh, I think that there's still catching up that the healthcare world has to do with other you know, mature and very critical systems like the world of finance and things like that. But um, getting data into an accessible and somewhat normalized fashion as a starting point is really a critical, that's, that's the critical building block. So, Dr. Mahajan, so you had a little bit of discussion regarding value, sh shifting over to value-based care. Now, this again is a concept that's being promoted heavily. We still don't have evidence that this actually results in better outcomes because we don't actually control what the patients do. You can try to give them information, you can give them reminders, but do they actually exercise? Do they actually change their diet? Do they actually take the fundamental changes? And that's always been a challenge. So what are you seeing in, uh, in your practice? Uh, and you have a hospital as well as a clinical-based uh, experience. So that's a good point you brought up, Sunil, that uh, you can have the best technology and, you know, you can uh, give the patient, hey, you know, I got a reminder from Shilin's great uh, software that, hey, you know, you need a flu shot, you need a pneumonia shot. And the patient say, you know, last time I got a flu shot, you know, I got sick. And Tony, my next door neighbor, got a flu shot and he got syphilis. So, you know, you say, okay, but you know, Shalane, his insurance company, the Humana Gold Plus, or for, for him, Freedom, wants me to do it, otherwise, you know, I won't get my cap check uh, bonus. They say, I don't care about your cap check bonus, you know, that's your problem. So the point I'm making and point he's making is that, you know, you can only push a system to the last person. The last person is a physician and a patient. And if the patient is not agreeable to do compliance for what you're recommending, and there's a whole slew of data on, on that, that 50% of the advice the pa physicians give to the patient, they don't follow it. Whether it's prescription medications, whether it's lifestyle changes, whether it's vaccination, whether going and getting a diagnostic test. And, you know, I think we need to understand where the patient is coming from. There is uh, deductibles, there is uh, cultural bias against medicine that, you know, that, uh, that I, they read on 
uh, you know, newspaper that if they take statin, they get diabetic. Hey, you know, okay, yeah, you know, there's a small percentage of that happening, but how much? You know, and if you look at how much mortality or lack of heart attacks and stroke the statins do, that's hugely minuscule. But, you know, they don't want diabetes because Susie, their uh, mother-in-law, lost their foot with diabetes. So, so you know, it, enforcing that piece is difficult. But patient portal uh, apps and, you know, continuing conversation with the patient, education of the patient, uh, giving good patient handout, not the paper in the hand that doesn't work because they lose it or their dog eats it, but, you know, putting on their portal and if you can convert them to look at the portal periodically, we are humans, you know, I look at this data, you know, I retain 10%, though we are all smart people in the room, but, uh, you know, if it's a thick data, we'll just get 10%. But if you put on the portal, they repeat, look at it again and again, you know, then there is a good possibility of adaptation. So technology can help, but it's gonna be still, if the insurance company wants a physician to raise the bar or technology to raise the bar, I think it has limited value or some value, not a whole lot of it. Yeah, and going along with that, there was a publication that came out recently where they did a study looking at the fitness trackers, Fitbit, et cetera, and comparing the groups without the trackers, with uh, patients with these trackers, and there was no improvement in activity levels or weight loss or any uh, outcome from that standpoint. And that's what the bottom line is going to come to. When you apply these new technologies, there's a lot of people reaching and say, oh, I think this could help with this aspect, but the bottom line will be what outcomes can you actually demonstrate? Now, in terms of the financial penalties, which tends to drive behavior, uh, institutions are being penalized if they have higher readmission rates. So I'm going to go ahead and try to shift over to what Anthony's trying to work on, trying to help the institutions deal with these issues and try to reduce readmission rates and hopefully uh, reduce the penalties that they're facing. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, Sunil. So, um, yeah, when it, <clears throat> when it comes to readmittance, I mean, just to go along with uh, Dr. Mahjan and uh, Sheelan were talking about as well, um, you know, it's a new world, and uh, the most important characteristics of new technologies in this world to help not just on the financial perspective is uh, there's some, some huge drivers, right? As Sheelan was mentioned as well, you've got new legislation, you've got a new fee-for-value world, you have this concept of fixed pricing, you know, in these types of procedures from ortho to cardiology to to... Uh, oncology, and it's 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 a basic concept that should have been there from the beginning, right? So, um, healthcare reform has co has come. Uh, there's been the CMS has already put out you know legislation and ushered in more re legislation such as MACRA and Backpack that has this fixed pricing, uh, you know, concept. And if you think about it, it's right. That's the way we buy our cars. That's the way we buy our clothes. That's why retail is 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 created. Um, so. Uh, specifically, when you look at reducing uh, the financial burden for hospitals and the way the new world is starting to work now when it, when it comes to penalties for readmittance, um, the health of a patient is really occurring uh, when they're leaving the hospital. So you can talk about the current supportive systems and the landscape and characteristics of EHRs that are out there on the market today. Um, they're capturing the patient record, but most of that information is happening when they're in the hospital. The way we live our lives, how we incur our health, our health habits, our rituals are all happening outside of the four walls of the hospital. So furthermore, um, we believe at Health Hero that it's important to reach patients where they're at, how, what they're doing, what they're not doing, helping them to help to deliver the message at the right time in the right way, in the right medium. And devices and apps may not be the answer. Um, a phone call may not be the answer. A text message may not be the answer. But it may vary for, for every single person. So we believe in this omni-channel approach. I think a couple of other characteristics that help reduce readmittance. Um, so let's assume you're getting the right message to the right person at the right time through telephone, through text, through apps, through connected devices. Uh, what's just as important is making sure that you're capturing that information, you're funneling it back, back into the system. But I think a more, most important undertone, I think what all of us are saying as well, is it starts with the, the patient. It starts with trust, and it doesn't matter if there's more legislation that's going to be pushing the market even further and more solutions and more investment opportunities in this space, you're really going to need to focus on the patient. So anyone in the space that's coming at this market, 
with a solution has to start with the patient in mind, has to reach them, um, consider that most of these new fixed pricing and bundled payments are, you know, really hitting geriatrics, you know, elderly, poor, elderly and poor. You have to resonate with them and they may not have a smartphone, they may not have a computer, they may have a telephone, they may text message. Um, so that's important to know. Um, and scale, I think, is important, Sunil. You know, I think that's an important point when it comes to readmittance is, you know, say you are going to be doing massive outreach. So, you know, all of us probably in our voicemail over the past four days have received some sort of robocall from some sort of marketing company. Well, hospitals and doctors more than ever are looking for scalable automated solutions to reach out to people. But it, it needs to be trustworthy and there needs to be empathy built in. So I think some other key characteristics in this new world that is additive to the EHR is that um, you, need, you need to be able to understand people's tone and sentiment and personality. You know, these are characteristics that go into the, the new world of, uh, of characteristics in uh, the technology solutions. You need to be able to predict, right? These are not the core competencies of an EHR, and so we have a strong thesis. This bears with it a new whole category of opportunity to, to improve the uh, the the financial burden for hospitals that to extend these EHR experiences. So. Any other comments you guys want to make on that? Just um, interestingly, and I made the statement that healthcare is behind a lot of other industries, and and this is one of the and it's 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 unfortunate, but this is one of the the definite benefits of it is that you can look. You know, a lot of other industries are making millions and millions of dollars by understanding, you know, where their where their end consumer is at, you know, what their where their headspace is, how to reach them using the right tone, the right sequence, uh, you know, in retail, in finance, in uh, you know, in 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 hospitality, all of those other industries. So, uh, you know, it's it's interesting that we're just now getting this is the first opportunity to really kind of be you know directing messaging to to the patient and having kind of the patient be. Uh, a more included part rather than just always being somebody who is coming when they're in a vulnerable moment to get care. This is more of a continuous thing. So it's, it's, it's really changing the dynamic of, of how the patient is, is um, you know, addressed in, in the whole process. And I wouldn't quite characterize that healthcare is behind. It's the focuses are different. You know, you look at a retail industry, you're trying to focus on marketing, you try to engage your client base. Healthcare, we're spending most of our resources to fix the problem. We're spending money on robotics uh, for surgery. We're looking at different imaging techniques, uh, stem cell therapies. We're looking at uh, all the CAR T cell therapies for cancer. So the investment and the focus is from an industry is on treating the underlying disease process. The data management part is a smaller piece. Yeah, absolutely. But I think that we all kind of reflected on the difficulty of you can know the perfect game plan, but will the will the patient take the meds at the right time? Will they follow the course of action? So that to me is an engagement problem of how do you get the consumer to do what we would like them to do, which is a which is a universal business problem, right? How do we move the consumer in, in the in you know in the ideal direction? And you're absolutely right. There's a lot of layers on top of it. But in the end, if we can make all those investments but the patient doesn't show up to the treatment center or doesn't follow the treatment when they're out of the building. Those are the those are some of the fundamental. You know, those are those are the breakdowns that that you know any level of investment on the actual treatment, research, clinical, um, are going to be hard pressed to 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 resolve. Sure. You know, one comment. Uh, if you think about it, one in hundred thousand uh, patients get wrong part uh, worked on in a OR. Um, one in ten thousand patients get a you know foreign body left in their you know, system at the time of surgery. And the solutions are very simple. Uh, there's just having a checklist, and that has been shown over and over again, if it's followed diligently, makes a huge difference. So sometimes the solution does not need to be fancy. Sometimes solution could be as simple as checklist. Um, and that has a huge real world benefit. There is a study going on in Florida hospitals where you know they are giving a checklist on patient coming with chest pain to the EDs and how to figure out which chest pains are real chest pains and which chest pains are just you know costochondritis or pain in the chest wall or gas pains and you know and then act quickly if it's a real chest pain from the heart and you know save the patient heart muscle so and again it's a checklist space it's not anything fancy and uh, the early data is suggesting it makes a big difference. So 
there are simple solutions. And the last point I want to make is, I think we need to think of healthcare delivery not in a traditional mode that, you know, you come in and, you know, you come in for whatever, uh, cough and cold, and you give me, you know, 30 bucks, uh, you know, not very willingly because, you know, you said, gee, it's, my insurance should have taken care of it, but why I'm getting charged co-payment. I think that model is redundant. You know, as Sunil pointed out, prevention and, you know, a lot of emphasis on preventing uh, things to happen, as Shalane was pointing out, keeping the diabetes where it is and keeping the glycemic control where it is. You need to think of population-based model where, uh, you know, the whole population, so the Aetna doesn't say, hey, you know, I'm not going to pay for, you know, let's say a fancy hep C drug, but hey, there is a 95% cure rate with hep C drug. Oh yeah, but it costs $60,000 a year. Uh, maybe if I deny it, deny it, maybe next enrollment period, you know, there will be sickness problem. So I think that mindset is hurting the patient care big time. It needs to be population based. All the players, physicians, uh, insurance industry, software industry, Everyone needs to focus on population health instead of individual health. That's great. So let me grab some of the questions you got from up there, back there. Thank you. All right, so let's see what the audience has asked about here. Okay. All right, so here's some questions about, we've heard about IBM Watson results regarding you know, some of the efforts in regards to uh, genomics and cancer treatment. Um, you were going to talk, touch a little bit about uh, some of the uh, computer algorithms versus physicians' decision making. So, <laughs> I'm glad that you asked that question because uh, I was talking to Sunil, you know, what we should present, and I was always enthusiastic about Watson Healthcare. Uh, in 1996, uh, you know, the IBM Deep Blue challenged Gary Kasparov, the current chess champion at the time, world chess champion, and Gary Kasparov won. So everyone thought, wow, man, you know, human beings are superior than computers. And then Deep Blue said, wait a minute, let's have a rematch. So in 97, there was a rematch between Deep Blue and Gary Kasparov, and Deep Blue won 3.5 to 2.5. And the Gary Kasparov said, oh, I didn't have the data, <laughs> what they have access to. So what happened was that led to the uh, Watson Healthcare, and they started thinking, gee, you know, if we can use that concept of Watson, which is cognitive computing, or using, you know, question answer based that the computer can understand question and conversations and improve their, uh, you know, AI or artificial intelligence like humans do. You know, I have a conversation with Shalane, Sunil, Anthony, like we're having today and with you guys, and suddenly, you know, I get out of this room and, you know, my uh, I, I, or not in my case, I, I, but my, IQ is a little bit better on, based on our conversation. Same thing they did with Watson in terms of their uh, coding that uh, it absorbs all the data, not only structured, but unstructured data as well. So what that led to was a um, collaboration with Sloan Catering. It's a, you know, as you all know, there's an um, oncology, uh, one of the premium oncology clinic in uh, New York, and then they did a uh, collaboration with MD Anderson with the University of Texas uh, on the oncology piece, and they fed all the textbooks, all the literature. If you think about it, uh, every year there's 150,000 uh, publications online uh, just on oncology sphere. PubMed has about uh, you know, 250 million papers uh, at the current uh, count. So as a physician, it's impossible for any physician, no matter how smart they are, there's studies done and average academic physician, minded academic physician spend five hours a month, that's it, on, on you know, reading journals and research. So if you're a community physician, you, know, you get trickled down when you go to your conferences and you know, maybe you read here and there with your family, with your uh, you know, commitment of the practice. So it's no way possible to sit down and, uh, you know, read all that. So, so Healthcare Watson now, they're collaborating with Epic, the, you know, that's another EMR or EHR company, and they have access to now about 80 million transactions through Epic and Mayo Clinic on regular medicine as well, in addition to the oncology aspects I was talking about. And they are working with Johnson & Johnson now on 
uh, collecting data, how to improve the hip and knee uh, uh, replacements. And they're working with Boston Children's Hospital about a specific kidney disease, how to diagnose it, which is rare, but if you have the symptom checkers put in there, they can pick it up. So, you know, is the computers gonna overtake physicians? Interestingly, there was a JAMA article just came on October 11th, right heart of the press, and they did an uh, analysis on um, three different forms of uh, difficult cases, common cases, in between cases. On a common case, let's say you come in with chest pain or shortness of breath to me, the physician outperforms the symptom checkers, the apps we have so-called by double, so twice they did better. But if you make the cases difficult, let's say we have Zika virus going on in, in our area, and you come to me with the body ache and fever, you know, I, I see 40 patients a day, I'm not gonna think Zika, I've not seen, seen a single case of Zika, maybe I miss a few, you know, because it's out there. So, you know, in that case, the symptom checkers did much, much, much better than the physicians who are smart physicians, they were fellows and resident, just out of the you know, training, so they, they are up to speed. So the point I'm trying to make is there is a space for collaborative work between healthcare wards, and let me give you another example, and I think it may help any of you who are uh, consumers. Uh, if you ever have a suspicion you have a rare disease, uh, jot down this number, I was doing research and I found this uh, very interesting, it's called isabelhealthcare.com. Now, Isabel is the name of a girl. Uh, it was a, you know, in 2000, uh, she was a three-year-old girl in London. The father, uh, Jason Maud, uh, he's an investment banker. He's not a physician or anything. So she had chicken pox, and she went to the national, famous national health system uh, in, in UK doctors, and, you know, the, some house doctors saw this uh, three-year-old girl, and they said, oh, gee, you know, classic chicken pox give the treatment, conservative treatment center home. They didn't, you know, at that point realize that she's having early onset necrotizing fasciitis where the flesh got eaten up. Very rare, but you gotta think about it, you know, if you, so poor girl went through, you know, six months of hospitalization, multiple surgeries. Luckily she survived. So this guy, Jason Maud, made it a life uh, mission to make sure the rare symptoms or syndromes or conditions like that don't get missed. So they came up with this concept of algorithm-based diagnostic. Uh, it's called Isabel Healthcare. And I think there's a role for that uh, if we can, the challenge will be integrating that in our day-to-day -day busy practices. We uh, probably have Time for a little bit more. Uh, there's a question about incentives to drive patient behavior. Anthony, you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so um, I, I think when it comes to incentives to, to um, for, for patients to, you know, as, she, as like Sheeling was mentioning, you know, how do you keep that diabetic that is on the fence uh, from turning from moderate to, moderate to severe or metabolic syndrome, pre-diabetic pre to like, um, you know, not, not crossing over that line? Um, so there are a variety of different mechanisms. Um, the business models, I think, are still being worked out. So obviously there's a huge amount of penalties for readmittance now. Um, every single quarter that goes by, there will be more exponential uh, bundles and bundled payment uh, fixed prices in key areas like oncology, cardiology, and orthopedics. What we find is those uh, specialty areas and family physicians as well are looking at ways, you know, how can we give incentives maybe back to the patient, right? So there's a lot of companies also coming out and coming out with new share savings types of models of, you know, maybe the company will take on, like an IT company like us may take on risk of the bundle. When is the best time to do that? How do we do shared savings? And maybe how can we split that savings with the patient? And maybe we give them an incentive to answer that message or that telephone call or that the, the, the follow-up. So um, I think it's the, the, the mechanics and tactics on how we give incentives to patients are still being worked out, but there's, a, there's going to be some money on the table to do that. Um, you can't really motivate necessarily patients just with mon from a monetary perspective. There's elements of, we feel there's elements of trust that need to be there, obviously. There's strong elements of usability, approachability, 
um, you can't make the patient think too much, and you also have to be extremely personalized into your approach. And uh, kind to kind, just to join kind of um, this thought with what Dr. Mahjong was saying about you know IBM Watson um, brand aside, you know the the cognition element of Watson and what's available there and the number of transactions like a Watson does, um, you have this, this, this incredible ability to personalize that message, right? To synthesize everything that a, that a platform like that c can do. So that I think is the, the power of what's among us right now. I think it'll be monetary, but we still have to focus on uh, a balance of those intrinsic, extrinsic motivators. So. Thank you. I think our time is wrapped up here. So I want to thank the panel for their time this morning and thank you for your attention.